we now have um, Grandmaster Matthew Sadler, England's number one chess player, and Women's International Master Natasha Reagan, who are here to talk to you about the fantastic book, Game Changer. So I'm going to hand you over to them. If you want to ask any questions, please do. We encourage questions. So if you ask them on the Q&A, um, if you can, or in the chat, I'll be observing those and I'll be able to um, you know, let them know when there's a good change. Oh, someone's already got the book. Brilliant. <laughs> um, so yeah, over to you guys. Thank you. Fantastic. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Natasha Regan. This is Matthew Sadler, Grandmaster. Um, and I'm going to share my screen now um, and we will be talking about Alpha Zero. Okay, can you all see that? Um, okay, um, our book is Game Changer and we are going to introduce you to Alpha Zero. Uh, so, what is Alpha Zero? Alpha Zero was built by DeepMind. Um, which is a UK company that researches artificial intelligence. And DeepMind was itself bought by Google in 2014. Um, AlphaZero is the sort of engine or computer that they built that got to super, superhuman strength at chess and also the other two strategy games, Go and Shogi. And it learned that entirely by teaching itself. Um, a very nice thing about it is that as well as being incredibly strong, Alpha Zero has a very nice style, a sort of attacking and intuitive style. And uh, to show how strong it is, it defeated Stockfish, the strongest traditional engine in a 1000 game match. It didn't actually start by playing chess, unusually for a chess engine. It started off by playing a different game uh, I don't know if any of you play it, but the Japanese um, game of Go. Tell us in the chat if you play Go. <laughs> yes, if you play Go, that's fantastic. Um, or if you play Shogi, fantastic too. Uh, really recommend those games. Um, now, in 2016, um, DeepMind were, were actually quite brave. They they took on uh, Lee C. Doll, who is um, considered one of the strongest Go players that ever lived. Um, they took him on in a five game match. And actually at the time they, they put out the challenge to him, AlphaGo was considerably weaker than Lee Sidol, uh, but they knew that they would be able to get it so strong. And in 2016, it won a televised match 4-1, much to the shock of um, professional Go players. So how, how did it reach its strength? Um, Alpha Zero, you know, doesn't learn like we do, doesn't learn from books. What it did was play games against itself. 44 million games to be precise. It played at lightning fast speed. Um, and by the way, does anyone know who that is in the photo? Let's see if I can actually get the chat on my screen. Yes. Oh, yes. Are you monitoring the chat? I, I, um, yes, we are. People are getting it right. Judith Polgarth, the strongest ever um, woman player. Um, and also what you won't have got right is I, th I imagine is uh, my identical twin daughters when they were uh, about eight years old. Um, so anyway, Alpha Zero, so it played 44 million games against itself. Um, how does it actually do its thinking? So it has, has kind of two neural networks. And what it looks at is just from a position, it just says, what does it think are the good moves in that type of position? Um, and that's without doing really any analysis. And then it goes deeper into those moves um, and then it evaluates the position. So how good is the position after you play these moves? And it sort of add, adds on moves kind of one at a time. Um, and then what it does when it wins a game, it, um, it's an, it kind of says, I want to play a bit more like that. Um, and when it loses a game, I want to play a bit less than that. And so it kind of just changes um, the, the policy net and the value net to reflect how it did in that game. Uh, so it's so just against itself, didn't need any human knowledge. Um, and it, it kind of taught itself 300 years of human chess knowledge in about nine hours. So imagine it at breakfast, it's playing pretty much randomly. By lunchtime, it could take games off the strongest computer in the world. And by dinner, it was the strongest chess engine the planet had ever seen. Um, I also want to draw your attention to the diagrams um, 
uh, around the side of um, this slide. And uh, you can see this is the, the, the number of um, the number there, so like 50,000 is how many games it had played. And this kind of shows the evolution of its openings. So you can see in that first diagram there, you can just about make it out. It's playing these crazy moves like E4 and then G4 and everything can be taken and it really does look very random. And then you start to see it, um, it discovers openings that we're familiar with. So uh, it's got the French defense by the time you get to 230,000 and um, by 700,000, it's learning Roy Lepers, this kind of thing. So it actually independently discovered a lot of the openings um, that you and I will play today. Um, so what were, what were DeepMind trying to do with this? They weren't actually um, just interested in getting a strong chess engine. They're interested in researching AI. Um, and what um, the traditional engines did, so if you look on the left, uh, Komodo and Stockfish, they've got really good pictures, don't you think? But they rely on a lot of human knowledge. So they did a kind of a huge database of factors in a chess position, a um, lot of calculation. Um, and, and so uh, they're very, very, very strong. Um, what AlphaZero did is a kind of learning system. So it taught itself. Uh, so humans wouldn't have to say a rook is worth such and such and a queen is worth such and such. Um, it, it kind of established itself what's important in the position. And from that, we can see what it comes up with and then learn new things ourselves about chess. Uh, here's an example that is um, from our book and it, it kind of shows Alpha Zero's style of play. Um, and you might've heard that Alpha Zero likes to sacrifice its pieces, likes open lines um, and values activity of its pieces above material. So a, a very nice style to watch actually. And this game, we titled it Exactly How to Attack. Um, and actually it was a very famous game at, at when um, the AlphaZero games first came out because it is a really beautiful game, a very attacking game. Um, and what we want to show with this slide is, is really uh, the difference in evaluations between AlphaZero and Stockfish. So if you look at that first diagram in the left, um, you look at the, the queens and the rooks there that we've got highlighted and they're very, very active. Um, however, uh, AlphaZero has given up pawns in order to get to this position. Um, AlphaZero thinks in terms of what's its expected score from the game. So it is in this position expecting a 56% from the game, meaning a little bit better than a draw, if you if you consider a win at 100% and a loss at 0%. Um, so it thinks a slight advantage to white based on this activity. Stockfish evaluates the position rather differently. It sees that it's material up. Um, it does think white has some positional advantage, but it actually thinks that black's a little bit better there. And what we saw throughout this game um, was that as the attack developed, Alpha Zero got more and more confident with its position and Stockfish kind of gradually realized that, um, that it was in trouble. And so by the middle position, um, White has actually transferred its rooks away from the, the king side where it was attacking and giving up pawns, right into the middle where it's gonna get an advantage there. And you'll see by the final position, it actually transfers back to an attack. Uh, but in that middle position, Alpha Zero is saying it's got way more chance of winning, it's 81%, way more chance of winning than drawing and, and, and very little chance of losing this position. Uh, Stockfish by now sees that white does have an advantage, uh, but sees it as less than a pawn advantage. And then by the final position, uh, both engines are agreed that this is really, really good attack for white. Um, and in this game, I think Alpha Zero gave up, I think it offered no less than seven pawn sacrifices during the game. It was uh, giving up a lot of material. Um, and, and this is showing uh, the two evaluations side by side. So looking at from White's point of view, and you can see that AlphaZero always thought it was a little bit better um, and its evaluation went up very quickly and Stockfish realized um, a little bit later than AlphaZero that it was in trouble. Okay, and uh, so what do, what do, what's this to do with us? Um, we wrote uh, the book Game Changer, uh, which was published by New in Chess. Um, and it was considered one of the most comprehensive analyses of the output of an expert AI, uh, published in 2019. Um, and, and our aim here was to show 
how we as humans can learn from Alpha Zero. Um, it's got a lot of good stuff in it. We interviewed um, Demesis Harbis, who's the Deep Mind CEO, and he himself was a very strong junior chess player, uh, just like you guys. And uh, then he actually went on, he, he actually uh, concentrated more on computers than chess after a while. Um, and it actually has stood him in good stead. He uh, set up DeepMind to do AI research. Um, and he now comes back to his love of chess and, and creates Alpha Zero. Uh, so we interviewed him, which was fascinating. Um, the, the, the core of the book, though, is an analysis of uh, the games that Alpha Zero plays. And we've divided the chapters up into themes so you can have a theme. And I think Matthew will be showing you a game of advancing rook spawns. Um, we've got lots of themes in there from Alpha Zero's play, lots of uh, brilliant games. Um, so you can kind of take it chapter at a time and, and, and look at how these attacks develop. Um, and it's really, really nice games. Okay, I'm going to show you a video of Magnus Carlsen and his first impressions of Game Changer. Hopefully this link will work. Can you see the video okay? Yeah. Magnus, the draw against Rajabov, I guess a satisfactory result for you. What happened in the game? Yeah, it's okay. It seems to be a theme by now that um, not much is happening in my, in my black games. Uh, and um, well, today I had, if I had any opportunity to play actively, it was with F5, but I didn't see um, what exactly would give me uh, and so I ch chose to play solidly instead and you could of course have played on instead of taking the repetition but it's I think it's pretty equal anyway. After your game did you have a look at uh, what your uh, opponents or your concurrents in the tournament how they're getting on? Uh, well I mean I saw Sam was doing fine early on uh, I don't know about now and uh, Jan was obviously better but I don't know by how much but um, it doesn't matter that much. I have a game a game tomorrow. This is from the uh, Weitkanze tournament in 2019, by the way, that, where we launched the book. What I focus on. Yesterday was a rest day. On the previous rest day, you published a video on the Instagram account running into the sea. Did you do anything as crazy yesterday to celebrate that victory over Nan? I don't think it's it's crazy. We're, we're at the sea. Uh, going uh, into the sea should be a normal. Uh, no, I... Yesterday, I... Just, I played a bit of football and that was it. The final question today, uh, the book Game Changer by Matthew Sadler and Natasha Regan is being presented here uh, in Vikanze. <laughs> Did you look at the games uh, which were released by Alpha Zero and what is your opinion on it? Uh, well, I, I uh, skimmed through the book yesterday and uh, I, yeah, I, it was quite inspirational and uh, I was thinking at several points during the game, how would Alpha Zero have approached this? But, uh, and then I, I mean, I, I thought Alpha Zero would have played F5, F4, and then very slowly tried to go G6, H5. And then I realized I'm not Alpha Zero and I made the draw. How close do you think you can get to being Alpha Zero? And <laughs> not very close. <laughs> Great, well, thank you very much for your thoughts and best of luck for tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, so if you want to learn more about AlphaZero's style of play, you know where to find it. You can uh, get Game Changer. Um, I would really, I mean, I, I'm a bit biased, of course, but I would really recommend it um, as a source of really nice games and you can learn a lot about chess. I think it's brilliant for their chess. Like, I've obviously read it and I've been very impressed and you learn all these different ideas that you don't necessarily appreciate. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you can also, there's a lot of material also on our Game Changer YouTube channel. So the link's there. So please do give it a try and follow our, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff, videos of not just um, Alpha Zero games, but also T-Set games, um, including Leela Zero and the latest Stockfish. Um, and so it's so lots of stuff there if you, you know, if even it might be stuff on your opening. So have a go. Um, and also follow what we're up to on our Facebook page. Um, okay. Um, I'm gonna hand over now to Matthew 
um, who's going to show you a little bit about this uh, really great Rooks Pawn game. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now, maybe. Oh, I, I better stop share then. Well, I can, I think I can take you over okay. there. So let's look. Yeah. Ah, there we are. And uh, let me share. Where's my uh, uh, screen? There we are. Share screen. Right. Uh, let me just get my game. Pushing Harry the H pawn this morning in the attack in the king session. And yeah, he definitely Ah, fantastic. <laughs> okay, I'll just um, tidy up my boards. I'm just trying to, uh, oh, well, we'll just make the board a bit bigger like that. There we are. Okay, so, um, uh, well, thanks very much, everyone, for, uh, for attending. So we're going to have a look at uh, a really nice uh, Alpha Zero game. Uh, called the Rooks Pawns Decoy. Um, just going to explain just uh, just quickly um, why I like um, Alpha Zero's uh, uh, game so much, and then we'll get on to the main game. And um, well, actually, um, um, you know, when I was uh, when I was quite young, actually, I had a lot of problems uh, improving. Um, I worked an awful lot. I was very hard working at chess, and I loved it greatly. But uh, really, had problems getting um, um, getting better and um, uh, what I discovered, it was all a bit by, by accident, really. But um, um, I found that, you know, when I worked at something very, very hard, um, I got a little bit, um, I got a little bit programmed and a bit robotic, really. And I used to um, to see, you know, playing a game of chess just purely like, uh, you know, calculating variations only and doing all the things I'd been taught, you know, trying to draw up a list of moves before I played and all of that. Um, and it really got a bit, um, it got a bit dull. And um, what I suddenly realized um, uh, one time when I was playing was that uh, there's a lot of drama in a chess game. It's just like a story in actual fact. I mean, there's, um, you know, I mean, you, you move a pawn up on the side of the board and, uh, and uh, the opponent's pieces rush over to capture it. And then your pieces go to the other side of the board and attack the opponent's king. And some of your pieces get, uh, get hacked down, but other ones make it to the opponent's king. There's a lot of drama in it. And um, um, when I started you know, thinking more about my games as a story, I found that I was um, actually planning a lot better because uh, you know, with a story, you're, um, you're not only looking at what's already happened and, uh, and enjoying the drama of it, you're also thinking about what's happened, what's gonna happen next. Um, and I mean, just another thing as well, you know, just for, for learning openings, I mean, rather than trying to remember a long list of lines and trying to remember them you know, by rote, um, what I always found was the best way to do it was to get, you know, this big, uh, as many dramatic games in that opening as possible. You know, if I had these huge attacks, then uh, when, I, when I actually played the opening, then uh, I think, oh, I remember this and this player, you know, did that great attack in that. And it really made me very excited to play my, uh, my stuff. Um, and that was one of the things that really grabbed me with Alpha Zero's games, because uh, Alpha Zero's games are full of drama. Um, you get these uh, enormous big themes happening in the game, sacrifices on one side, then outflanking the opponent and rushing to the other, big attacks, material imbalances. It was really, you know, inspiring, inspirational games and games where, which uh, you, you remember very easily and then that you can apply very easily in your own games. And um, well, this was, um, um, this was one of them. It's the, uh, we call it the Rooks Pawns Decoy. And I'm going to start, um, um, well, Let's just, uh, we're going to run through the opening moves and uh, we'll just, uh, um, won't spend too much time on this. This is the Queen's Indian defense. Alpha Zero was uh, very, very keen on, on 1d4 and 1 knight f3. Um, so um, it played when, um, when it was left to choose its openings, it played these. And this is um, um, quite a solid variation, the, the Queen's Indian, uh, g3, um, and um, nothing much uh, exciting happening, just getting the pieces into play right from the start. But here, um, um, actually, I got a book quite recently on the Queen's Indian, and uh, the author looked at about, I think it was nine or 10 possibilities in this position, um, but didn't actually look at the, at, the, um, um, at the move that Alpha Zero played, which uh, um, was uh, quite new when it did it, and that was to play the move A4, um, it's always one of those um, one of those funny things, really. That um, um, if you have to, if you you see an alpha zero position and you're asked to guess the move, 
then um, often it's something with the rook's pawn. Um, normally on the king side, though, uh, but uh, this time it's the queen side. And um, uh, but as you're going to see, it's going to work out to um, uh, to be a king side attack um, in the end. Um, what's the value of using a rook's pawn? Um, a rook's pawn is a very nice way of starting uh, uh, an attack on a wing with um, with minimal means. Um, the reason is that um, you know if in the end you lose a rook's pawn, it's the most dam the least damaging thing to lose in a position because it's right on the side. I mean, if you move your, your the g pawn up in front of your king and you lose that, then your king's exposed. If you move a rook's pawn uh, uh, up and you lose it, well, things are you still haven't ruined your position. You can carry on. And um, what actually happened in this game was that Alpha Zero um, just um, uh, moved this rook's pawn up all the way up to a6 um, with the following idea. So um, a6, it forces the bishop to undevelop. So um, already black's uh, queenside pieces are um, a little bit passive there. The problem is, of course, though, is that moving a pawn that close to the opponent's position, it makes it very easy to attack. And this pawn on a6 is doomed in the long run. However, it's going to cost black some time to, uh, to round up that pawn. And whilst black's Focusing on the queen side, Alpha Zero is going to move over on the king side and get something going. Now it's not uh, winning or anything like that, but it's a great way of injecting a lot of tension and uh, a lot of drama into the position. Suddenly, it's not just uh, you know an equal position where uh, both sides are well developed. There's huge amounts of imbalance in the position, and that's what Alpha Zero always does really, really well. So, okay, White um, um, played F4. Black played knight b8, black's going after that pawn on a6, it's doomed. King h1, um, worth seeing this moment. Um, always when it's starting an attack, um, alpha zero always takes a move to put its king to safety, um, gets it out of the way of random checks. Um, it's quite noticeable, every single attack I've seen, um, it's always doing that. And uh, Gary Kasparov was a very big one uh, for, uh, for doing the same. You see these sort of quiet king moves, just when you're expecting white to really attack like a, like a crazy person, he, um, he just um, moves the king out of the way, puts it safe. So definitely uh, an attacking uh, theme worth, uh, worth noticing there. So knight takes a6 and f5. Black went rook e8. White went e4, breaking in the center. Um, black tried to keep the center closed, and then knight e2. Um, so let's have a little look at this position, just try and uh, understand what's happened. So, um, yeah, I mean, black's a pawn up. So black's captured that pawn. But obviously, um, this knight that was, uh, it was here before, and a little bit sort of, um, well, a little bit close to the black king, it's now had to move right over to the queen side. So. Uh, uh, Alpha Zero has managed to divert a piece over to the queen side, a black piece. Um, also, um, an interesting thing is, you know, when you give away a rook's pawn, there's, uh, um, you do lose a pawn, but there's something else that happens. It's that, um, um, well, the rook that, uh, the rook that uh, was, uh, um, the rook actually becomes incredibly active in that position. We've given away a rook's pawn, so your rook becomes active. And uh, giving away pawns to activate its major pieces, that's a big, big theme of alpha zeros. You see it all over the place. And what you notice is that um, this rook is attacking the knight, and it's tying this bishop, um, whoops, sorry, this bishop on c8. It's tying it to its protection. So you've actually got pieces, uh, black pieces, that are sort of being dragged towards the queen side. Whereas, of course, the king is on the king side here. Um, what, apart from that, what has white got? Well, white's got this, um, this, uh, these three sort of central pawns, king side pawns, ready to break, um, well, ready to, uh, to attack the black king. Um, but on the other hand, you know, black's got plenty of, um, uh, plenty of defensive resources. Um, and Stockfish defends in a very interesting way. Now, Stockfish, um, enormous, fantastic defender, best defender in the business by, uh, by miles, can hold uh, awful positions for, uh, for years and years and not seem to worry at all. So, um, but Stockfish has got a very interesting way of defending. Actually, we look a lot of that in, uh, in Game Changer uh, because it's, it's very, very, um, uh, yeah, very, very interesting. And, uh, and it, it, yeah, you can sort of apply it a bit in your games as well. What, Alf, what um, uh, Stockfish does is uh, it always tries to defend with minimal pieces. So you never see it really sort of crowding its king around with defensive pieces. 
Um, but what it's, what's very important to stockfish, it tries to keep its kingside pawns untouched. It really tries to avoid moving them. Uh, the idea being that if your kingside pawns are on their original squares, then white's got to reach forward an awful lot in order to get at them. It costs white an awful lot of effort. So the further you keep them away, the more effort white has to make to, uh, to do that, to, uh, to get at them. And in the meantime, what Stockfish tries to do, it tries to exchange off your, uh, your attacking pieces. It's a bit like uh, you're climbing a ladder uh, to get up to a tower and somebody's sawing away the legs uh, um, whilst you're doing that, you know, just by exchanging off your attacking pieces. And here um, um, Stockfish is uh, trying to exchange off, for example, this, um, whoops, this uh, dark squared bishop. However, um, Alpha Zero now comes up with a, um, um, a stunning little idea here. Um, really quite, um, um, quite beautiful. Um, it's, um, uh, and it's really a, a about um, really crossing the, um, um, uh, the plan that Black's got because Black's um, idea of minimal pieces on the king's side to defend, exchange off the white attacking pieces, it works really as long as Black's king side is not um, is um, pristine, is sort of as it was, you know, just uh, just like that. However, if we if we manage to break open that king side, then Black will suddenly regret not having that many defensive pieces around. And Alpha Zero played this fantastic double pawn sacrifice. Takes e6, pawn takes, pawn takes, takes, and then knight to f4. And um, yeah, I mean, what you notice. Um, is that, um, well, by giving away those two pawns, okay, Alpha Zero is now three pawns down. But what Alpha Zero has actually done is created a lot of targets for its pieces. First of all, this Black King's incredibly airy now. Um, you know, it used to have, it used to have these, uh, these pawns on, uh, on F7 and G7 protecting it. And now these pawns have moved over to um, uh, F6 and E6. So it means, for example, that we've got a, um, a Queen G4 check. It means that this rook is now actually attacking a pawn rather than blocked by its own. It's just opened up, you know, a huge amount of lines for um, for uh, um, um, for white pieces. And uh, I mean, Alpha Zero, you know, before um, um, actually before Stockfish played this move, Bishop B4, it was giving itself a 56% expected score, which means it would roughly expect to score five and a half out of ten uh, from uh, from this position. Um, after the, um, the pawn sacrifice, it went up to about 78%. So you'd be expecting to score 78, seven, uh, seven, seven and a half or eight out of 10. So, you know, big, big difference. Now, Stockfish battened down the hatches and we're coming up to a tactical puzzle here now. So uh, um, uh, start paying attention now. So E5 and um, Knight H5. Um, and now, first of all, we're going to do a really easy tactical puzzle. Now, Stockfish um, is a great defender and uh, analyzing, I don't know how many million moves a, a, a second, it suddenly realized that it was uh, that its uh, original intention was um, not very good. So it actually played a move um, that, um, um, well, kept it alive, but um, uh, in the long term, it was always going to lose. Um, but we're going to have a look at, uh, at that move first of all, and then we're going to have a look at the, the really nice defense. Um, so Stockfish played the move uh, Bishop E7. Now, this is a, a question for all of you. Um, how does white win this position? Just tell us privately in the chat. Just send a message to the panelists like you did this morning. Yeah, just to the panelists. Otherwise, uh, if you want to be the, uh, or if you can always share, I suppose, but, uh, but then everyone sees your solution. <laughs> So let's have a look. Ah, oh, there we are. Some detail as well, not just one move. <laughs> ah, yeah. Give me um, um, if you've got the first move. Give me the give me the follow up afterwards as well. That would be great as well. But I think uh, I can see a lot of people are um, are getting it right. Um, oh, we've got some we've got some creative uh, creative uh, solutions as well. Yeah, we've got the, um, there we are, that's very good. So um, the interesting thing is uh, in this position, White's got this um, uh, tactic rook takes a6. And um, um, uh, the idea, well, let's just show the idea. First of all, is if bishop takes, we go queen g4 check. And if you go king h8, then I go queen g7 and mate. 
Um, now that's a, a very simple one. I just want to point out one, one little thing about it. It's that um, it's one of those um, uh, skills that actually engines uh, do amazingly, but also you've got some of the great attacking players like Mikhail Tal, um, who managed to do this somehow. They managed to weave together both sides of the board because um, the reason this tactic works, the reason uh, this all works is because White's actually played this move a up to a6, got the knight coming over here, and then somehow managed to involve this rook on a1 in the whole attack with rook takes a6. And uh, well, I call that whole board play in actual fact, that you, you take the whole board into account, even when you're thinking about attacking on, on a narrow channel like the king's side. And um, you'd, again, you see that um, enormous amounts in, um, in uh um, in Alpha Zero's games, that uh, you know things happening on both sides of the board are suddenly woven together and uh, and lead to a kingside attack. And here, this beautiful idea: move the pawn to a6, sacrifice the a pawn, activated this rook, and then this rook suddenly became the queen's rook on a1, not moved, suddenly became a key piece for an attack on the king side. Um, it's incredibly clever play, and um, um, it's one of the big, you know, the, the big super attacking player skills. But Black had another defense here, which was um, to play Rook F8. Um, and um, uh, uh, the idea of that is actually that um, if you again, if you play Rook A6 again and Queen check, well, this time the king can run for the hills with uh, king f7, and it's not actually that easy to put the black king away. So there is actually a better move, um, which is that white after, whoops, rook f8. Might be showing them after queen g7, um, and white oh, yeah. takes f6. Let, let's do that. So a uh, rook a6, bishop a6, queen g4 check, king f7, queen g7, we go round to e6 here. Um, and... Yeah. Um, yeah, we're sort of um, we're not doing great. I will uh, I will say, but we uh, we are sort of uh, surviving here with c5. Um, we're also threatening to take on f1 there. So um, uh, yeah, I mean it's not um, it's not fantastic, but it's not um, it's not too bad. Actually, I also think that after rook a6, we've also got um, the possibility of playing bishop takes d2 as well, which I should point out. Um, and uh, I take a piece back, and then if you go queen d2, I'll go bishop h, bishop takes a6 here. And uh, again, your attack's not really um, uh, moving that nicely. What we've got here, though, we've got the move um, bishop h6, and then the best defense was to play bishop e7 to cover the pawn on f6, and now. White can play rook takes a6, bishop takes a6, queen g4 check. And now the move king f7. King h8 is going to allow queen g7 mate. So we're going to go king f7. Now, first little puzzle for you. Um, oh, actually, I'll just make one more move here. I'm going to play this move, bishop h3, aiming, just getting one more piece into the attack and threatening to play queen e6 check. And then as black, I'm going to be super greedy, and I'm going to take that rook on f1. All the pieces that you sack, I'm just going to take. Now, tactical puzzle for you. White to play and win. White actually to, um, um, to give force mate in actual fact. And this is not an easy one. So, um, uh, okay, what have we got here? We've, we've got, I'm, I'm seeing, uh, I've got queen e6. Black, move. Don't just assume they're gonna play a bad move. Indeed, yeah. I mean, uh, very important to think that, um, um, that Black is um, the, world's, the world's best defensive player ever. So he's not just gonna give you, uh, he's not just gonna give you everything. Give you mate in two after queen e6. <laughs> ah, I've seen a solution already. I've seen a solution already. That's very, very good. Um, okay, so basically, we've got three moves in here. Um, a a four moves, I think, that have uh, been suggested. So we'll go through them one by one. So queen e6 check. 
is a, a very obvious try here. Um, because if king e8, we've got knight g7 checkmate. Um, however, um, after king g6, um, it's rather tough to put the, um, uh, the black king away. Um, it's actually threatening um, uh, this knight on h5, and it's also threatening the, uh, the bishop on h6. So um, yeah, actually, there's um, there's no um, uh, there's no mate in um, in this position. Uh, you've got to draw by uh, by repetition. Well, or rather, you can go back to the original position, because after King H6, you've got Queen G7 and Bishop G4 checkmate, which is uh, uh, quite sweet. But um, um, uh, but after Queen but um, after Queen E6 check here, um, King G6 then um, uh, you've got nothing better than, uh, than just repeating the position. Um, now, if you go um, knight g7, that's quite a, um, quite a nice move. Um, but it's just a little bit tricky to see how you're going to proceed. If I keep on soaring away the ladders, the, the, the rungs of your ladder by playing bishop takes um, h3, um, because if I go queen h5 check here, um, I just go king g8. And I've escaped once again, just uh, very, 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 very conf uh, confusing these positions. It's a bit like uh, like squashing jelly. That's what it feels like sometimes. Whoops, I'm uh, going completely bananas there. So uh, uh, king f7. Um, so one, uh, let me just, uh, sorry, just have a quick look at the chat again. So one big idea is to go queen g7 check because with our move bishop h3, we cut off the king's escape. So king e8 is the move. But this actually looks quite difficult to um, um, uh, to solve this one because uh, um, knight takes f6 check is um, is very tempting. Um, if bishop f6, we've got the old queen f8 and checkmate. That bishop is covering the uh, uh, the king's escape square. Um, but in actual fact, we just go uh, rook to f6, and um, um, there's no real way to put things away. I mean, something like queen g8, I'll go bishop f8. So that's pretty, um, um, yeah, I mean, that looks, um, that looks pretty, um, uh, pretty good for, um, for, um, uh, for black. However, there is a, an absolutely gorgeous way to, uh, to do this. Um, and um, uh, it's um, been pointed out by a number of people in the chat now. Um, it's um, a beautiful uh, solution, one of the most beautiful I've ever seen. Um, it's always to do with, um, it's not just um, your own pieces that have to cover squares, you know, to stop a king from, um, from, ex from um, escaping. Um, often it's, uh, it's enough if you can, um, yeah, leave the, op leave the opponent's pieces to, uh, to cover ki the king's escape squares. And this is kind of what happens here, because White's got this beautiful move, queen g6 check. Um, black takes the queen. Why not? A queen up. But then white delivers a, a quite beautiful mate with um, uh, knight g7 check, king to f7, and then the absolutely beautiful bishop e6 checkmate. And um, well, Stockfish has, has indeed been soaring away at, uh, at the rungs of Alpha Zero's ladder. Um, so much material has been, uh, has been taken, captured, and given away. But uh, white, with just three minor pieces, manages to deliver mate. Um, and um, um, in actual fact, you know, one of the, the key things about the combination is that this bishop on e7, the rook on f6, and black's pawns on f6 and g6 actually prevent the black king from moving away. So actually with white's pieces, white doesn't really need to control that many squares. Just um, a couple of important ones, e8 uh, in particular, and then just uh, find a way to, uh, to deliver a check. I mean, that's an absolutely beautiful mate. Um, I was so uh, thrilled when I uh, when I was analysing this game and I uh, and I found this. Um, but I think the um, you know I think that the most um, important thing um, just to take away from uh, from this game I think is um, is just that um, um, that sense of um, first of all you know the drama of the game um, and the you know the big sweep of it. So a decoy on one side um, that actually. Um, takes away um, black pieces from the defense, um, but also involves all of your pieces in the attack. Um, and the idea that this rook on a1 uh, could be involved on a kingside attack just because it got activated by giving away the pawn in front of it. That's something that, um, that's really stuck in my mind and, uh, and uh, 
Um, I know that if I ever see a, see a game with this sort of idea, you know, I'll never forget about it because, yeah, there's such this uh, incredibly dramatic game that uh, that I could, uh, you know, that, that, I'll, that I'll just never forget. And um, I think that is, uh, you know, something that I, I think is very important uh, for you, you know, as you uh, progress and as you do more more work at chess, to really try for everything that you want to learn, try and find, you know, examples like this, dramatic examples, things that uh, that demonstrate uh, the theme you want to learn and that will always stick in your in, in your mind because, uh, yeah, they're just so incredible and amazing. And um, like that, I think it makes, you know, the effort of, uh, of memorization, um, I think it makes it a lot, lot easier. Um, and there's a lot of information to memorize in chess with openings and, uh, and endings and everything like that. But um, having stuff like this that's fun, that, uh, that gets you excited, you know, that makes, it, uh, makes that memorization effort uh, a lot, lot easier. So there we are. I think that's uh, probably uh, um, all I want to tell you about this game. That's brilliant. Um, some questions. Um, do you mind answering? Uh, what's the difference between Alpha Zero and Layer Zero? Case is desperate to ask that. So good question. Oh, that's a very that's a very good question. Yeah, very very good. So, um, well, Alpha Zero that was a um, uh, that was done by uh, the deep the company DeepMind, um, but actually they weren't really. Um, um, uh, into chess, actually, um, Demis Hassabis, who um, uh, is the uh, uh, well, the, the big guy at uh, Deep Mind, he was a chess player. We, and Natasha and I knew him when he was uh, very young, very good chess player. Um, but actually, um, all of the guys who um, who made um, who uh, um, worked on uh, Alpha Zero, very few of them were chess players. They were into IT and uh, uh, AI and and all that sort of stuff. But and, um, um, they 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 weren't any shogi players at all. And I think they even got the rules of Shogi slightly wrong when they tried to code that one up. Yeah, for the first time, then they had to uh, they, had, they had to ask somebody, you know, have we got the rules right? But um, what they actually did then, they uh, but they made this great um, uh, AI uh, just with the idea of um, of uh, saying, could we make a system that could teach itself, you know, in order to uh, to do that? And then they use that for for lots of other things in uh, in science. But somebody um, uh, they re they um, released um, a, a scientific paper explaining what all their um, science was, how they'd actually done it. And then um, uh, the Liga Zero guys took that paper and then just started re-implementing it with, um, um, in, the, in their own way. And that became Leela Zero. So Leela Zero was just inspired by Alpha Zero, all the science that DeepMind released. Uh, they took that and then just made Leela Zero. And uh, well, obviously, you know, um, uh, Leela Zero, um, it's been training now for, uh, for, you know, three, four years. It's got unbelievably strong. Um, and you can um, have access to Leela Zero, so you can actually install it on your own machines. You need, um, I think, you recommended to have a good graphics card on your machine to install Zero, uh, Leela Zero, uh, but you can like then set up your own games Leela Zero against Stockfish if you want to. Exactly. So I mean, um, um, yeah, I mean Leela Zero, you can just download from um, I think it's lczero.org. And um, download it, install it on your uh, on your computer, and um, and you've got um, and you've got it's like having uh, Kasparov on your computer there to help you. Um, I mean, also you know, Stockfish is also uh, downloadable and uh, um, you know, I, I, you know, um, absolutely awesome uh, um, you know uh, player as well. So I mean, uh, just imagine you can have all of that just on your own PC, helping and analyzing your games. You know, so um, why do you tell the children to analyze their games using a board first and not putting an engine on? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a very, that's a very good. I mean, actually, the, the way that I do it um, um, is uh, what I always do. Um, I've got a little timer next to me, and uh, I set it to about ten or fifteen minutes, and um, um, then I try and analyze, you know, uh, uh, by myself. Then I, afterwards, I um, I write down the lines that I found without an engine. Uh, it takes about you know two or three minutes, and then afterwards, I analyze it with the engine. And, uh, you know, I give myself points uh, for uh, if I uh, do it well and uh, enough points adds up to a chocolate biscuit. That's what, basically what, uh, how it works. So, um, um, but um, I, I can tell you, um, I, I'm, I think Sarah's got it, nailed it absolutely there. That is really so important to be able to do that because, you know, during a game, yeah, you don't have stockfish next to you helping you. So, um, um, and, um, you know, when you're looking at stuff with stockfish, oh, loads of decisions seem very obvious, but during a game, there's lots of stuff that suddenly seems worrying, you know, and, uh, oh, is that tactic really good? Is that correct? You've got to get used to, uh, to analyzing stuff yourself. Um, yeah, so, 
they say, oh, I was winning um, and I lost, I'm so annoyed, but they weren't really winning because they didn't understand how they could have won because they lost the game. So I think it's very important for them to analyse on their own first and then check it with the engine. Um, okay. So I've just asked if you want to ask a question to Matthew and Natasha, just raise your hand. And we've got two questions. So um, Great. I'm going to ask you verbally. So we've got Rudder first. So you should be able to unmute yourself and ask away. Um, if Leela Chess Zero um, is like made after like um, Alpha Zero, like in the same way, yeah. like, then isn't it um, like copying? Yeah, but um, actually that's, that was what DeepMind wanted. So DeepMind did publish a paper, um, actually two different papers. So one paper when it had first made Alpha Zero and then one about a year later um, once it had gone through kind of all these scientific processes and peer reviews. And it spelled out exactly how Alpha Zero had been made, um, which then allowed the Lilo Zero developers to, to copy sort of every detail as, as much as it wanted. And, um, and so then they've got a, a kind of open source version that people have trained on their own computers. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, the thing was that, um, uh, so DeepMind, uh, they're scientists, you know, and uh, scientists discover things, and then they share it with other people, and then other people build on that and make it even better. And uh, that was the idea. I mean, um, uh, DeepMind uh, with Alpha Zero, they made it great, and then they stopped and moved on to other stuff. Whereas uh, the Leela chess guys, they were chess guys. So they've just uh, carried on and taken it further. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're three years on now from, uh, from Alpha Zero and uh, you know, the, the Leela guys have, um, they, they re-implemented what, um, what Alpha Zero was. And then they just added more and more and more stuff. And, uh, and it's just getting stronger and stronger, mm -hmm. just like Stockfish, you know. Uh, yeah, Stockfish, Stockfish has from, also uh, added in some neural net uh, components to itself as well. Well, it didn't do it itself, people did it. Um, yeah. But, but that's actually got stronger too, based on the same technology. Yeah. So I mean, you're right. It's uh, it's copying, but it's um, it was that was actually the idea. You know, um, I think uh, uh, DeepMind didn't want it to be um, a dead end. You know, that um, Alpha Zero was there and then it was gone. Um, they wanted it to uh, to spark other stuff, and uh, and it has. You know, people have really run with it, and um, um, yeah. I mean, uh, you wouldn't have thought that things could get uh, that engines could get stronger and stronger, but every year, you know, they're getting uh, they're getting better and better. So um, it's uh, and at the moment, actually, I, I don't know whether you um, whether anyone's following it at all, but uh, there is a, a big computer chess world championship going on um, called the TCEC, and um, uh, it's a big match between uh, Stockfish. The latest version of Stockfish and uh, the latest version of Leela and uh, very exciting Stockfish stuff. Stockfish is in the lead at the moment. Stockfish is in the lead at the moment. So uh, all very, very exciting. So uh, well worth following uh, if uh, if you come across that. It's uh, tcec-chess.org, uh, dot I think, um, mm. is, uh, is uh, or chess.com, sorry, is the uh, is the thing. And uh, fantastic games and, uh, and lots of great stuff. Brilliant, thank you. So we've got um, Charlie Hill next. Um, so, Charlie Hill, you should be able to talk now and ask your question. Hi, Matthew and Natasha. Um, Hi. Hey. Really interesting learning about the computers and how they're evolving. But do you think that one day, um, if black plays perfectly, it will be impossible for white to win? Um, I think so. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's right. Um, I mean, uh, I think you know, uh, probably engines they're 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 so good nowadays. Um, but if you just um, um, you know give them the starting position and then just let them play, then um, um, you know they can um, they they can uh, hold a draw against each other. You know they they're, they're good enough for that. Um, the but, thing for us though is we'd have to remember it all, so it, yeah, it doesn't yeah. really it doesn't really I, stop I, us enjoying chess because there's so many different possibilities, and it's I, I mean I would say impossible for us to remember all of the things you'd need to remember to uh, for that to matter for your game. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you know, from a, from a human point of view, um, uh, we'll never solve chess because, um, yeah, as Natasha says, impossible to remember all of the lines and everything that computers find. So uh, it's not really that you know that important practically. But and what you also notice though is that um, um, there there are many different positions, you know, in uh, in chess, and uh, and engines are not perfect in any of them. I mean, there's uh, there's many positions which uh, still which uh, human players just with um, with just insight. Uh, you know, can uh, they can see they can uh, assess them better than engines? So um, you know, there's still um, 
still plenty of room for uh, for engines to improve and still um, plenty of areas in which engines have to improve better than humans but you know over a um in terms of uh, playing practically you know um maybe you know humans can play good moves for uh, for six or seven moves but then they get tired and uh, and uh, engines can keep on playing wonderful moves you know for hundreds of moves on end there's no way that a human can deal with that but uh, in terms of um you know of understanding chess understanding positions and all that you know humans still have got quite a lot to offer amazingly you know i think that's to a bit of a pat on the shoulder for humans because it uh, shows how amazing we are that we can um, still in some positions match engines that are calculating hundreds of millions of moves per second. Great, thank you thank very you. much. Good question, Charlie. Um, we've got the other Charlie now to ask a question. Charlie Ball, so I'll just allow you to talk. Oops, hang on. Uh, wrong price. Here we go. Um, <laughs> just a minute. Um, so you can take on that. So, um, Okay, so yeah, Charlie um, Bull now. Um, okay, you should be able to talk. Go ahead. Um, so have you released like a new book or are you working on like a new book at all? <laughs> ooh, ooh. ooh. See, secret. Oh, I'm excited to see what it does. Now that's always top secret. Um, I mean, what we've done um, actually is, um, as Natasha mentioned, on our um, uh, Game Changer YouTube channel, um, those are um, extra games actually, because um, uh, yeah, Game Changer is you know, a reasonably big book, but we actually, um, we had so much material, you know, we could have done, we could have done twice as big a books or two, two or three books. But um, um, what we actually did, we put that into um, um, all the extra games that we had, we put on our YouTube channel. Um, and did videos about them. So I think there's um, about 20, 25 videos of, uh, of Alpha Zero games that are not in the Game Changer, but, um, but that we'd analyzed at the, uh, at the time. Um, and then, um, yeah, we, we also did some, uh, a lot of uh, videos as well on, um, on, the, um, on the Computer Chess World Championships um, with Leela and Stockfish and other things like Komodo and Ethereal and all these other crazy crazy engines that um uh that are also you know just incredibly strong so um and uh yeah i mean um I'm always uh, busy just uh, looking at engine games so you never know what might uh, what might happen in the future with um with a new but there's certainly enough to write about i mean uh, it's um and some incredible chess to uh, to look at as well that's a good question i see um, he's avoiding the answer <laughs> well, that sounds good um yeah thanks charlie and um, move on to the next question now which is from Amaya, so you should be able to talk now. So go ahead, Amaya Patel. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, um, I just wanted to ask, how long do you think Alpha to Zero to play for? Will it be infinite news? Oh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Say it again. How long could Alpha Zero play for? I think she's saying, how long can Alpha Zero play for? Can can Alpha Zero play for infinite moves? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So, so so it can. Um, it um, so normally you'd set a day, a time limit maybe for the game, and then it it actually uh, the version we had didn't wasn't especially sophisticated in in how much time it would use up. So it'd use up about a twentieth of its time um, for each move. Um, so basically, you can set it as long as you like. Um, and so actually you could play really, really quick games or, um, yeah, any, any number of moves um, to make a long game. And actually engine games sometimes are very long because they don't get bored. And so they, they can play kind of hundreds of moves just trying to slightly improve their position. Um, when, it was, yeah, when it was initially training, they did cut off the length of the game um, because they didn't want it, like when it was playing completely random at first, you could have got very, very long games that weren't really teaching it very much. Uh, so what it did then was uh, set a move limit. And if it wasn't a decisive result after that limit, they would call it a draw and, and to let it carry on training. But when once it now it's actually got its its, it's sort of fully trained version and it can play as, as long as it likes. Okay, okay thanks, Maya. Um, next question from Zengu Chen. So that I think that's William. So I'll just move you onto the stage. Um, okay, yes, ask away. You should be able to um, talk now. If the same um, engine plays itself, will it always be a draw? 
That's a, that's a very good question. Um, uh, almost always, yes. Um, so um, you see it with um, with uh, Stockfish playing itself, and uh, um, I th uh, also with AlphaZero playing itself as well. It's um, uh, ninety nine percent um, uh, a draw. Um, I think the reason that um, that the AlphaZero Stockfish match was so exciting um, was because you had two very different types of engines playing against each other. So you had this um, um, this engine AlphaZero, which uh, doesn't calculate so much but has these great ideas about where to put its pieces and uh, strategy and all that. And then you had Stockfish, which was um, an absolutely magnificent calculator, great defender, but less good at planning. And uh, well, those two, they always had such different ideas about the position that they um, that everything was basically tactical fireworks and, uh, and crazy stuff and sacrifices and all of that. Um, but if you get two engines that um, that think the same, um, then um, uh, yeah, you do often you get interesting games, but very often uh, leading to a draw because you know they both uh, they sort of cancel each other out. Um, happens in human chess as well. You know, I mean, two defensive players playing against each other don't actually get very far. You know, whereas uh, um, you know an, uh, an attacking player against a defensive player that always you know leads to uh, leads to fireworks. So, uh, but yeah, in principle, if, you, if they play against themselves, uh, you can expect, um, you know, pretty much 99% draws. Okay, thank you. Um, DV, your turn to ask your question. Um, how, how many times did AlphaZero lose games? All right. Do you want to answer that, Natasha? Yeah, it did lose some. So in the first match, I think it was six from the um, original starting position. Uh, correct me if I'm getting my numbers wrong, but it would lose games. Um, and it was mainly when it was black against Stockfish, um, where it was playing. It, it lost a bit more in the um, TSEC openings, where it was told which moves to play at first. And there were certain positions where it didn't really like the position, like there was this one in the French defense um, where it really didn't like the position and it, it started going a bit crazy and sacrificing all its pieces. Um, but in, in general, it lost very few games in that match um, and um, won a lot more. Um, and so I think it was, I've forgotten the exact numbers, uh, but it was, um, I, I think it was six that it lost in the original. Yeah, it, it won um, from, from that thousand game match, it, uh, it won 155, uh, lost six and, uh, and uh, and drew the rest. Um, yeah, I mean, um, it's um, uh, yeah. It, I mean, considering uh, the great thing about it was that uh, considering how um, how riskily it played with uh, lots and lots of sacrifices, it was really quite uh, amazing that it um, uh, that it lost so few. And I think that was the uh, the incredible thing, really. Um, you know, the style that it played, and yet uh, you know the number of games it won, and the 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 the, the, the few games where it really all went horribly wrong. That was. Um, yeah, that was that was one of the incredible things. So, uh, but yeah, no, it's not. Um, um, it's just like, but you know, even nowadays, uh, the very strongest engines—they're not infallible. They're not perfect. There's still uh, lots of stuff that they um, that they don't know. But there's, uh, yeah, a lot of stuff that they can do that that we can't, of course. Great, thank you. There's a few questions in the Q and A that we haven't got to yet. So, why didn't Stockfish play Bishop takes a six instead of Knight takes a six to stop e four and maybe Knight e two? So that's a good oh, question from Shiva. That's a very good one. Let's should we go back to the? Uh, I'm showing my screen, aren't I? So we can go back to the position. Um, yeah, Bishop a six is um, is uh, um, is a, 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 a absolutely another possibility. I mean, white um, white still plays f five all the same, um, and um, uh, yeah, I mean it's kind of the same basic situation, right? This um, this uh, bishop's attacked by the rook, so the bishop will have to um, um, to move back at some stage in order to allow the knight to develop. But it's um, it's um, um, absolutely um, uh, um, a good defensive uh, possibility as well. I mean. White's um, got a number of ideas. Um, F6 is going to be, um, might well uh, come in. Um, we can also move the rook over F4 to G4 as well, and then later play E4. But it's one, it's a, it's a main defensive possibility as well. Um, so uh, yeah, no, good spot, good spot that. The one uh, advantage of Bishop A6, of course, is that it stops um, uh, or dissuades E4 because of, uh, oops, not because of that, because of, um, because of Bishop takes F1 afterwards. So also very interesting defensive move. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so um, we're going to wrap it up soon, but um, a very good question from Rowan. Um, obviously, Matthew, you're um, very, very good at chess, and he wants to know how you got there and how long it took. Any advice for the children? All right, okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I started chess when I was seven. Um, I was an IM when I was 14 and a GM when I was 19. Um, uh, it's nothing remarkable nowadays, uh, to be honest, but, um, but in those days, that was, um, that was fairly good. I, I remember I, I got the, the, the world record for, um, uh, for being an international master. Uh, that was uh, the world record. I was, uh, I think, maybe just 14 or just before it. Then two days later, Judith Polgar, great women's player of course she was two years younger and she beat me to it so um uh, i think that's all actually a very good lesson about chess also playing chess internationally you always find people that are better than you so uh, it's, you've always got to be humble about it because uh, you never know where the next genius is going to come along from um i got good i suppose um by well working a lot i mean i i love and uh, and loving chess i suppose those, those are the two most important things and they they hang together because um uh, you need to work at chess you need to learn stuff um but if you don't love it then it always feels like a chore and when you do love chess um then it doesn't feel like a chore you spend time without realizing it um i think the um um the most um important thing that um uh that i discovered was um i think when i was uh, little i was always um uh trying to do things the right way I i'd say you know which was uh, following what the books told me and um and you know uh trying to think in the way that the books told me and all of that and just gradually as i got a bit older um i discovered that yeah that that's great advice um great advice but what's also important is to think about how you want to do things as well because uh, everyone's got their own personality and everyone's got their own thing that they bring to chess and uh, the most important thing is to, to try and understand um, I want to play the way that I like I want to play the way that um, um, that um, uh, I understand best and I want to believe in myself. I want to believe that um, that the way that I do things is is really worthwhile. And um, so those two things, you know, working hard, learning the, the the basics and the techniques, but also really trusting in yourself and really trying to to put your uh, your own personality into your chess. I think that's how you become good. Um, because we're not we're not you know we're not robots. We're not uh, uh, everyone who every chess player who learns you know, the same bit of knowledge, interprets it in a different way and puts their own personality into it and makes something special of it. And I think that's what you've really got to believe in, you know, that uh, believe in the, in, in the idea that you're special, that, you, that uh, your personality is something um, uh, important that you can bring to the game of chess and then just work hard to make sure that, you know, you've got all the, te the, the technical skills so that you spot tactics, you can solve mate in threes, you know how to win knight and bishop against... Uh, uh, against king in the ending um you, you know you know when uh, when you, you've got a good feeling when you should attack and when you should defend you know but um but never lose sight of, let, let never lose uh, uh, sight of the fact that um that at the end of the day it's um uh you know it's about putting your personality onto the chessboard and enjoying being yourself on the chessboard and uh um to be honest that's something that it took me a, a long time to uh to um to understand that and i think uh, that's when i really made my big um, my big uh, jumps in uh, in strength. I made a big jump when I was about um, eleven or twelve. I was about rated about one sixty, one uh, one seventy ECF grade, and then all of a sudden the next uh, list I was uh, two about two twenty, um, and I did that when I uh, suddenly discovered openings that I really liked playing that really inspired me, and then again when I was um, um, when I was about um, uh, nineteen or twenty. I was rated about uh, then a FIDE rating then about 2550 and I just made a, um, a huge jump to, uh, to 2650 just um, just by understanding some more stuff and also actually getting uh, inspired by um, um, by a, a coach who I worked with just for two weeks but uh, the Russian coach Mark Toretsky I just worked with him for two weeks and uh, and that really changed my life I have to say. Um, so, <laughs> Well, yeah, that's right. I mean, um, the thing about him was actually that, um, I mean, I learned some some great technical stuff, but it wasn't really that. It's just that um, when I talked to him, um, he was an incredibly empathetic guy. And uh, I was, um, you know, again, in a period of working hard, not really getting anywhere, um, not really improving any further than, uh, than that and wondering why that was. 
And um, he was so sympathetic. He'd worked with all the best players in the world, and yet he still took time to spend some time on me. And uh, he said, to, you know, I was sort of uh, full of doubts, uh, you know, and, and he was saying, well, you know, actually, you're, you're, you're a pretty good player. And uh, that feeling of being told by somebody who'd worked with Kramnik, with Kasparov, with all those guys who said, you know, yeah, you know, you're, you're a good player, too. Um, I can tell you that that bit of confidence that I got there that lasted with me for the whole of my uh, professional career. And I still think about it nowadays. So um, I would say as well that um, um, I mean, in my career as, as a young player, um, um, you know, I've had my mix of, I'd say, of good and bad coaches, uh, I'd say. I think it's very important as well to find people that you trust, people that, um, you know, can give you good advice and can also, you know, tell you, uh, not afraid of telling you some other stuff when uh, you're not doing it well, to say, hey, you know, shouldn't you just work a little bit harder or uh, shouldn't you look at this stuff? Um, very important as well to find people you trust who can give you good advice throughout your career because, you um, um, one of the things I did, you know, I, I wasn't actually didn't have an, a coach after the age of 14. Um, I, uh, I stopped with it then. Um, and not until I worked with Mark Doretsky for a couple of weeks when I was uh, about 20, 21. Uh, I didn't have any coaching until then. And um, it was sort of positive and negative. You know, in some ways, I, um, I worked out a lot of things for myself. But I also discovered, looking back, that I couldn't sort out everything myself. And, uh, and I think I made, you know, some mistakes along the way and I could have done some stuff better. But very important as well, I think, to, you know, if, to, to find somebody to, to help you, who you trust. And it could be, you know, just a friend, a friend that loves chess as well, and that you work together with, try openings out against each other. But you need to have someone like that, I think, to reach your full potential. Um, I mean, my parents were, were gorgeous and they were lovely and uh, they gave me huge amounts of moral support, um, but they weren't chess players. They didn't, you know, they, they didn't. So they couldn't really give me any, any real chess advice. They could just be lovely and, uh, and give me a lovely home, you know, and, uh, and lots of support. But it is very important to find someone like that. And as I said, it could be a friend, somebody else who's keen on chess and wants to work with you. Or if you're lucky, it's, uh, it's a great coach who... Um, who knows how things are and can tell you what to do, you know. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I think those are, th those are quite big important things. Hard work, trusting yourself, and, um, and really trying to, uh, to put the best of yourself um, onto the chessboard, and also finding somebody that you can talk to who can help you to, uh, to improve as well, somebody you trust who's, who's, who only wants the best for you, you know. And uh, with those three things, I, I think you can achieve anything. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matthew. That's really inspiring. We've got some great players here that are really hoping to get to the next level. Well, that's great. I'm going to have to wrap it up there. Um, but I'm sure if anyone wants to ask anything um, to Matthew. And of course, yeah. yeah. Um, they'll hang around. But you can, you can leave now. Let me just share um, the screen. I'll send this to your parents anyway. I just... Um, so we've got, um, we've got a test on the work we've been doing this month, um, Attacking the King. So the link to it is there. It will be emailed to your parents. Um, don't rush through it and um, get the chessboard out, play the positions out on the board. Um, you can only do it once and you need to do it using your real name so we know who's doing it. Um, and then the uh, topic for February is positional chess. So we're going to send the materials out on Monday. Um, here's uh, the lovely book that we've been talking about, which you can get on Amazon. And we've got a link, the premium sessions that are going ahead in February. We've got Glenn Fleer looking at pawn end games, and we've got more on Brandon looking at positional chess, and we've also got Daniel King joining us. Oh, very good. Do some stalemates in the end game, and he's very good. Um, so lots of exciting things in the February lineup. Uh, thanks for joining today, and um, yeah, you can leave um, the meeting now and um, ask us any questions.